So, my former father-in-law told me to run away far away from his daughter without looking back the first time he met me. He said I seemed like a good person. At our wedding, he told my parents, nothing good will come of this. It's going to end in disaster. His wife said she hoped their daughter wouldn't mess this one up like the others. And yet, there I was, a few years into that marriage, heading to Home Goods alone at the start of a seven-day effort to achieve radio silence, or what the couples therapist referred to as an inadvisable gag order, because my wife had announced in our latest session that she did not want to be spoken to. So I left the house to give her space and buy myself some new bedding after months of her unexplained, unexplainable growing intolerance of me, feeling absolutely nauseous, wondering why she refused to come back to our bed, tormented in the crisp, plain white sheets she always insisted upon that now smelled like our distant past, and sleepless nights under the comforter we'd bought enthusiastically right after our wedding. She'd been living in the guest room for several weeks at that point, spending as little time with me as possible, coming home later and later, no explanation, just locking the door behind her. So I went to Home Goods on the heels of yet another unsuccessful Saturday therapy sesh, trying to accept that things were not getting any better. And I got this rad, fuzzy buffalo plaid comforter, and intentionally not white, navy blue striped sheets. <laughs> Monday morning, I got an unexpected text from her while I was at work asking if we could talk about something on Tuesday night. I asked what this was about. To what do I owe this breach of our radio silence? Please, don't make me wait a full 28 hours playing out every possible scenario. Just tell me what's going on. She texted back, forget it not important. So I caved and I said okay to Tuesday and predictably spent the next 28 hours convinced this would be the point where she'd say she was moving out, that she'd found someone else. Anything, really, to explain her strange transformation in the last several months. But instead, she wanted to talk about why I changed the bedding. <laughs> and what if she wanted to come and sleep next to me again? And now, it feels like I'm pushing her out. Now, she doesn't feel welcome in our home anymore. And then she closed and locked the door to the guest room again that night anyway. The last several months, she'd become increasingly annoyed with me. She said it was because I made her feel invisible for two years, but that's definitely not how I remembered it. Why hadn't she brought this up at any point in two years? When I asked how we could fix it, what I could do better, she told me the best way is to give her space and time and don't talk to her for any reason unless it's about the laundry. She was mysteriously still doing my laundry and folding my underwear while we were in therapy. And zooming in from her lair in the guest room, she'd offer only that she wanted me to, one, stop asking her to come back to bed. And two, stop asking her what was happening to our marriage. But those were the only questions I had. Well, that and why are you still folding my underwear? You are fucking so weird. And the only answers she'd give me were, every time you ask, you only make it worse for yourself. And maybe I'm just better at living together in silence than you are. Like that's something to be proud of. And during that time, I was assaulted and abused with quite possibly the most destructive weapon I know to exist on this planet, my own brain. 
and it was given a thousand acres on an impossible scavenger hunt to run in any direction. My thoughts got soft and loopy. I remember feeling confused all the time. I started to actually believe that my audacity might be making this worse. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am asking too many questions. Maybe I deserve this. It is absolutely possible for another person to head fuck you enough that your mind short circuits and creates all these unhealthy neural pathways that teach you to blame yourself against all evidence pointing to the contrary. My... My brother told me several times to file for divorce and get the fuck out of there. I even went to my in-laws for advice. They asked if there might be someone else in her life. And when I said I suspected, but she was denying it, they advised me to go to church and pray. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I had no idea how many times they'd already been through this before. So, after six months of unanswered questions, I snooped through her laptop for evidence of the cheating, and for the bargain price of $19.99 and an exceptionally overdue background check of her public records, I discovered she was never the person I believed her to be. She had found someone else. She was in deep shit with the IRS. She never actually earned the college degree she mentioned so often. And she had a 26-year-old daughter she never told me about. <laughs> it was an emotional homicide, a death of my mind and spirit on a thousand acre hamster wheel. And after that, of course, things moved quickly. I filed for divorce, asked her to leave, sold the house, moved in with my parents, and found a new therapist to begin unpacking how the fuck I ended up in something <laughs> like that. <laughs> this new therapist endeavored to get to the heart of the deficit that got me into that mess. Turns out, I didn't have much practice loving or respecting myself. And so part of our work was identifying and naming the different parts of me, my psyche to differentiate the sides of me that make up who I am as a whole person. We all have a few different sides to us. Not like multiple personalities. More like a round table of characters that stand up and sit down as we make our way through the goings on of each day. So like my inner child. Little Jamie steps up happily when there's a vanilla milkshake or roller skates or a really cool arcade game. And teacher Jamie is patient and knowledgeable and manages my classroom during the school year. And my mama bear comes out in moments of responsibility with my dog or a kiddo. I've got my inner Eagle Scout, the part of me always wanting to do the right thing chivalrous, kind, talks to people in the grocery store line, good friend, good daughter, good human. And I have my protector, the full metal alchemist, the side of me that I have credited with keeping me safe through some pretty harrowing battles. My full metal alchemist is the part of me covered in scars. I wasn't born with it. It was conceived when I was 10 years old and found the courage finally to tell someone that my cousin had been molesting me since I was six. And my aunt and uncle called me a liar. And it started growing muscles when I was a teenager during loud explosive arguments with my stepdad and the time he threw me out for not putting a paper towel over my spaghetti in the microwave. And when I was 18 and my high school girlfriend started dating a guy without telling me, when I confronted her, she said our three years together was just a phase. She wanted to be normal now and that he fucked her better than I could. 
And when my biological dad asked me to edit his autobiography, but chose not to include me in it, and the time he outed me to my bully of a stepsister, and when I was forced to wear a pink cleavage dress and high heels to officiate my brother's wedding, and every time I've been called a dyke, every time I've been asked to leave a woman's restroom because I don't look enough like a woman, every time I felt unwelcome shopping in the men's section, every time I've been lashed or pushed or encouraged to excuse injustice, battle after battle, it's forged armor tempered and cooled into this layered suit now nearly impervious to any blow. The Full Metal Alchemist is a blend of brawn and brain, the part of me that bench presses refrigerators while doing crosswords in the basement. It is the side of me that is unwavering and confident, a warrior fighting for justice for Jamie above all else. It is the side with fuck around and find out energy. And after my marriage collapsed, my full metal alchemist made a promise that I would never again participate in hamster wheel scavenger hunts. <laughs> and so in moments when I feel shut out or shut down, at the very whisper of a spherical treadmill of bewilderment, I am reminded that PTSD is very real. We're not there yet. <laughs> There's still more. <laughs> Fast forward to a few weeks ago and what started as a relatively tame misunderstanding with my current sweetie. She is a woman who deftly holds up a very clean mirror for better and worse. And for the first time in my life, I feel safe enough to start studying the shapes of the scars I've been protecting under all this armor. And on the night of this misunderstanding, I walked into the living room intent on being understood. She said she didn't want to talk right now, not when I had my armor on. And so there I was feeling all dressed up with nowhere to go. <laughs> so I pushed the conversation again, and she refused to engage. I went to take a bath and grab my wits, but when I came out, she'd set herself up in the guest room with the door closed. And I lost my shit. Fuck around and find out. In an instant, I am suited up for battle, armed to verbally paralyze anything in the way. It feels unhinged and manic. It feels willful and stubborn like it's fighting for my life. It is relentless and confrontational. I can't stop it. I can't calm it down. I can't tell it to take a seat. I can't see. I can't hear. I can't think. I can't distract myself. I can't find kindness or peace or empathy or compassion only laser focus on justice for Jamie, whatever it takes. Like being tied to an anchor at the bottom of an ocean with the determination to swim to the surface, even if it means ripping off my own leg. And once there is air in my lungs, it's gonna use quick logic and Sherlock evidence, collecting and recycling ammunition from the direct words and actions of anyone who dares to stand in front of it. And if you walk away, it becomes more urgent. If you tell me to go cool off, it feeds off ancient, unrelated resentment from monsters who had their way with me. If you stay silent, it'll talk until we're both exhausted. If you defend yourself, it'll discredit your narrative. If you close the door, it'll open it and persist. If you lock the door, it'll wait quietly and design all kinds of pathways to its own righteousness. Sometimes it's a ventriloquist and it puts words in my mouth. Sometimes it tempts me to abandon ship before it drives full speed into the rocks. 
I don't need this. I'm better off alone. And my sweetie said, Jamie, you are in this room with ghosts. And just like pufferfish and peacocks and skunks, when I am fighting my ghosts, my protection is all a big, stinky, inconvenient illusion overcompensating for how outmatched I feel in that moment. It sounds like a fiery Beethoven, but underneath it all is a single note. I am afraid. I am afraid of being abandoned. I am afraid of things I didn't see coming. I am afraid of my trust being fucked with. I am afraid of confusion. I am afraid of closed doors. I am afraid of hamster wheels. I wasn't born afraid of these things. I was taught to fear them. I learned I was vulnerable from those who exploited my vulnerabilities. And a warrior emerged. But now I'm living in this beautiful meadow with the battlefields behind me, and my warrior has become this aging knight who throws Molotov cocktails at the windmills. <laughs> and afterwards, it is a mess of shame and apologies Afterwards, I have no excuse for myself. Afterwards, the remaining members of my psyche crew have to make amends with brooms and mops and dumpsters for the complacent damage we caused, not knowing how to comfort it when the armor is just too hot for a hug. My warrior hangs out in the basement most days and only races up the stairs when the alarm goes off. But the sensor is faulty now, and its tripwire is sensitive. It's not a beast. It's not a monster. It's a badass that saved my life a few times, and I'm grateful for it. But I am also incredibly aware that its strength is now sometimes an unnecessary detriment, like a champion bodybuilder working at Jamba Juice. <laughs> It dominated in battles against cowards and creeps who set themselves on fire and tried to sit in my lap. But there are no embers or hints of smoke in the air now. There is nothing to fight or protect. With so many victories in the history books, it's time to pack the armor away and come up from out of the basement. It's time to sit at the table and tell stories as part of this family. Rest now, soldier. The war is over. Jamie Barker, ladies and gentlemen, Jamie Barker.